Welcome back, everyone. In the last part of uh, the previous lecture, I left you with this following fact, namely that triangular matrices uh, are invertible if and only if the diagonal entries are not zero. And I asked you to think about why that might be true. And I'll actually explain why that's not true right now. Suppose that you have an upper triangular matrix. Okay. Well, let's say that your diagonal entries are not zero. Let's say your diagonal entries are not zero. Well, what does that mean? Well, when you put it into row reduced form, okay, what that means is you're going to actually have that the pivots are on the diagonal because you're looking at a square matrix. And in fact, because the matrix is upper triangular, it's already in echelon form. So the diagonal entries, if they're not zero, they're actually just the pivots. But if you have pivots on the diagonal, that means that your matrix can be row reduced to the identity. A can be reduced to the identity, which is another way of saying that A is invertible. And here we're using the classification theorem of invertible matrices. So that gives you an, an explanation of what happens when A is upper triangular. But now what about the lower triangular? It actually follows from the upper triangular case because of the following fact. If A is lower triangular, then when you take the transpose of this matrix, you get something that's upper triangular. And it actually goes back back and forth, right? If you have an upper triangular matrix and you take the transpose, you get something that's lower triangular. So we have that A is invertible by the classification theorem. It's the same thing that A transpose is invertible. But the A transpose would be an upper triangular matrix. And we just proved that this upper triangular matrix will be invertible if and only if the diagonal entries are not zero. Okay, So this gives you a, a quick explanation about why triangular matrices are invertible. And we're making use of the fact of the classification theorem. And as just as a quick example, this I want to point out that this explains the first example. And I'll, I'll show it to you in a second i.e. k cannot equal to zero. So let's go back to the first example here that we were looking at. Right? For what k is this matrix below invertible? Well, this is a lower triangular matrix. So for this matrix to be invertible, we can't have any zeros on the diagonal. But the diagonal is always going to be the same number. And so as long as k is not equal to zero, these numbers are all not zero. Okay, so the matrix would be invertible. So they give you a completely different way of showing the exact same thing that we, we did up here, that the matrix is invertible if and only if k is not equal to zero. Okay. Now, hopefully one theme that you're seeing in this course is that when you're looking at matrices, you can always think about a linear transformation happening at the same time. So linear transformations and properties of matrices go hand in hand. So we introduce a property of matrices, namely being invertible. So we want to know what does that correspond to when we talk about linear transformations. Now, first, we'll introduce a definition. A linear transformation from Rn to Rn, so I want the n's to be the same here, is invertible if there exists another linear transformation from Rn to Rn, such that if you first plug x into t and then put that outcome back into s, you go back to the x that you started with. Or similarly, if you plugged x into s and then plugged it back into t, you get x that you started with. Okay. So that's the formal algebraic definition. I think the following picture will probably help you a little bit better. On this side, we have an Rn. And on this side, we have an Rn. And T is a linear transformation from one side to the other. So let's say I take my x and I'm going to use my function t. And I map it over to this element right over here. So this will be my map t. Now, the, the function s, you want to think of, so I, I'm going kind of this way for my 
think of T as mapping from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. Now we want to think of S as being the map going from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. And so it will take this value over here and it will map it to S T of X. And what we want is we want the, the output to be the thing that you started with. So let me give my little hand tool here. A map is going to be invertible is that if I take something over here, map it over here, and then use my my map S to map my map S, let's give this a label, to map it back, I end up where I started with. And that's the first part of this statement right here. The second part is really saying the same thing is that if instead I had started with something over here, mapped it here via S, and then mapped it back by T, I end up in the same spot. So that's what a ma uh, matrix, uh, uh, what it means for a linear transformation to be invertible. So one of the reasons we like linear transformations, right, is that attached to each linear transformation is a standard matrix, i.e. there's a matrix A such that we can represent the linear transformation as A times X, as a matrix multiplication. So let's kind of put some of the pieces together here. Let's say that you have a linear transformation from Rn to Rn. Okay, so we're in this situation and we go from here to here. And we want to know is, is that function invertible? Well, then it happens to be invertible. T is invertible if and only if the standard matrix is invertible. So the invertibility of the matrix A is capturing whether the function T is an invertible linear transformation. And not only that, uh, I'll explain what this notation is in a second, because I forgot to uh, write that down. If T is invertible, then the standard matrix of T inverse, which is going to be the map that allows you to go back, is simply going to be the map that you get by multiplying by A inverse. Okay, so is A inverse, i.e. the inverse map, excuse me, let me make that a little bit clearer for you. The inverse map is the map that you get by multiplying by the inverse of the matrix A. And as I said, I actually forgot to define what this notation is. So let me just go back and, and rectify that. So in the definition, S is called the inverse of T and denoted T inverse. So S is the map that allows you to go backwards. And that's why we have a, a little negative sign there to represent backwards. And I might as well just put that in here as well. That would be T inverse. So we have that we can think of functions going back and forth from Rn to Rn. And that's captured by the matrix A. And the matrix A, this you can go backwards if and only if the standard matrix is invertible. And just one, the rough idea of why this works, well, it uses more properties of the classification theorem. In particular, what we have is that T is invertible if and only if the function t is both on to and one to one. But if you look at what this means in terms of the standard matrix, what that means is that ax uh, is on to and one to one. And if we go back to our classification theorem, that's the same thing as saying that a is invertible. Okay. That kind of finishes up our, our little discussion in today's lecture about uh, invertible matrices. In the next part of today's lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about partition matrices.